The ongoing rise of LA Knight has been one of the most organic and authentic rises of any superstar we've seen in the WWE in many years, but to many casual fans, they have no clue where LA Knight came from or the stuff he did in order to get to where he is today. Selling out buildings and having the biggest pops of any show wasn't done overnight. Sean Ricker, better known as LA Knight or even Eli Drake, began his professional wrestling career in 2003 after moving to Cincinnati, Ohio. He began training at the age of 20 years old and in that same year he began working for a company called Heartland Wrestling Association under his first ring name Deuce. And no, not Deuce from WWE, even though they had a great theme song. The next year, Sean would win his first championship in the HWA, the HWA Television Championship. And during his time in HWA and Ohio, Sean would begin to become roommates with a very young John Moxley or Dean Ambrose, which he talked about more about in his most recent Chris Van Vliet interview. I don't think I can get into too many details there. Uh, it was it was a wild time. I mean, after leaving Cincinnati a few years later, Sean would begin working for the NWA's Championship wrestling from Hollywood. Really his first taste of television wrestling where he would begin a tag team called the Natural Selection, a tag team with the now all elite wrestling star Brian Cage, and in a matter of months after the team started, Brian and Sean would get their hands on championship gold as they would defeat the Rockness Monsters to become the first NWA Heritage Tag Team Champions. Natural Selection would hold on to the tag team titles from the end of January 2010 to early April 2010 where they'd lose the championships to the Rockness Monsters but would regain them late that year in December. Their second reign would be from December of 2010 to early July of 2011 where they lose the championships to the Tribe due to Brian Cage missing the event, forcing Sean to take on the Tribe in a handicap match, and from that point on, Sean would begin to feud with his former tag team partner for several months, defeating Brian Cage to win their feud and end it in the late part of 2012. And in that same year, Sean would then challenge Adam Pearce for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, coming up unsuccessful, but this wasn't the last time Sean and Adam and would cross paths in their careers. And after his time in Championship from Hollywood would come to a close, Sean would sign with the WWE in May of that same year, where he'd become one of the many stars reporting to the WWE Performance Center as the next crop of NXT talent. This is around the same time where the infamous Triple H workout video was recorded, which is now very popular at this time due to the LA Knight appearance in it. Sean would be given the name Slate Randall and only wrestle dark matches against the likes of Yoshi Tatsu, Baron Corbin, Mojo Rawley, and Mason Ryan before he was eventually released from the company in August of the next year. Sean has stated that the reason for his release was not because of talent issues, but because of perception issues because he was preserved as a jerk. After being released from WWE, Sean would return to the independent scene, this time under the name Eli Drake, where he would tour multiple independent companies until 2015 which was the time that Eli would sign with Impact Wrestling, possibly the company that made him the man he is today. Eli would make his debut for the company as a member of The Rising, a trio put together by Drew Galloway or Drew McIntyre for WWE fans, and Micah, or better known as Tonga Loa in New Japan Pro Wrestling. The trio was created to come together and stop the quote unquote bullies known as the Beatdown Clan, which was a very pushed group at the time led by MVP with members such as Low Key, Samoa Joe, Bobby Lashley, Kenny King, and more. The Rising would only last a short time together as they debuted at the end of March but would lose a 4 on 3 handicap match in July where they'd be forced to dissolve as a group. And just a matter of 2 weeks later after The Rising's disbanding, Eli would begin his rise to the top as he turned heel on his former friend and rising teammate Drew Galloway, costing Drew the Impact World Championship against Ethan Carter III. EC3. Drew and Eli would begin to feud for the majority of 2015, but once the feud wrapped up, Eli would finally begin to become a top heel in the company, winning the Feast or Fired match with a case that contained a championship shot at a future King of the Mountain title match. For those unaware, Feast or Fired is almost like Impact's Money in the Bank match, although each corner post has its own case most holding championship shots, but one has a case that holds a pink slip firing someone from the company. Drake would cash in his case at the end of May, defeating Bram for the King of the Mountain Championship just a matter of moments after Bram was attacked by Bobby Lashley. After this, Drake would begin his Fact of Life segment which became very popular for his character inside Impact Wrestling, and at this time he would invite James Storm, a TNA legend, as a guest. 
He'd proceed to insult Storm, but it would not end well as the two would begin a feud for the King of the Mountain Championship. And it ended in early August where Drake would lose his King of the Mountain Championship to James Storm. After a few months in impact of not doing much, in October he would enter the Bound for Glory Gauntlet Tournament for the Bound of Glory pay-per-view. He would eliminate Tyrus to win the entire thing. And just a month later, Drake attempted to cash in his Bound for Glory opportunity on Eddie Edwards for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, but would eventually fail that cash-in attempt. Then after that, Eli would go into a feud with EC3 in a title shot versus voice match where if Drake lost, he would not be able to talk for the rest of 2016, but if EC3 lost, he would lose his heavyweight championship shot. What the hell is TNA? Either way, EC3 won by submission, forcing Eli Drake to not be able to talk for the next, like, two weeks left in the year. Drake would continue to do a few more mid-card feuds throughout the year, finishing up 2016 and early 2017, until August of 2017, where Drake would win a 20-man gauntlet match from the second entrant position to win the vacant GFW Global Championship. Later, it was just returned to the Impact Global Championship. No matter the name of the championship, this was Eli's first championship reign in a major promotion. Eli would tour the world going to places such as Pro Wrestling Noah to defend his championship against the likes of Matt Seidel and Cody Hall, and would hold his championship until early February of 2018, where he would face the returning Austin Aries, who was making his return to Impact Wrestling following his departure from WWE just a few months prior. In the same segment, Aries would challenge Drake and the match would take place right then and there where Aries would dethrone Eli Drake and regain the Impact World Championship that he held years prior. Following his loss of the Impact World Championship, Drake would once again be thrown inside the Feast or Fired stipulation where he'd once again win a championship match, but this time it was for the Impact World Tag Team Championships, which he was not very happy about. Due to this, Drake challenged Moose for his World Championship briefcase in April of that same year, which he won. And just a matter of weeks later, Drake would finally find a tag team partner to take on LAX for the World Tag Team Championships, and his partner would be none other than, than Big Papa Pump himself, Scott Steiner. Steiner and Drake would defeat the Latin American Exchange, or Santana and Ortiz as they're known now as AEW, to win the Impact World Tag Team Championships, which they'd only hold for a few weeks as they'd lose them to DJZ and Andrew Everett just a few weeks later on Impact Wrestling. From there on, Eli Drake would continue to do lower mid-card feuds and even go into a feud facing legends from TNA's past such as Tommy Dreamer, Raven, Abyss slash Joseph Park, and many more, before he'd eventually go into a semi-tweener turn slash face turn where he would become a tag team with Eddie Edwards. They'd win a few matches and challenge for the Impact Tag Team Championships, but eventually fail that match. And during that time, Eli was set to take on Tessa Blanchard at United We Stand that year, but Eli legitimately refused to partake in the match and criticized intergender wrestling. Due to this, he was replaced in the match by Joey Ryan, but after the situation, he made comments basically trashing Impact's booking of him. He'd announced a while after that in June that he had now become a free agent. Just a matter of weeks after his contract expired with Impact Wrestling and he was announced a free agent, he would show up at Best in the World for Ring of Honor, being revealed as the mystery partner for Nick Aldis and the newest person to sign with the NWA. Eli would go on to form a tag team with James Storm where they would win the NWA World Tag Team Championships, but after dropping the titles not too long later, Eli would leave NWA silently after only just signing a new contract the year prior. Then at NXT TakeOver Vintage Day that same month, Eli would make his shocking NXT debut, debuting on the pre-show under his new name LA Knight, which now is a name everyone knows, but back then it was one of the many names that was trashed during the changes, Gunther being another example. Most changes during this time were very trash, but now it just feels so common that it's like nothing ever happened. Knight would debut as a heel and do a few squash feuds, like defeating Cameron Grimes in a ladder match to win the Million Dollar Championship. He would do a lot of heel feuds leading up to NXT 2.0 where he'd lose to the debuting Braun Breaker on the very first night of the program. And due to this, this would turn LA Knight face as he going to the War Games feud as the NXT Originals, which I still to this day don't understand why they called him an original, but he teamed with Johnny Gargano, Pete Dunn, and Tommaso Ciampa as Team Black and Gold, where they defeated Team 2.0, Braun Breaker, Carmelo Hayes, Grayson Waller, and Tony D'Angelo in War Games. And off of this, LA Knight would start a singles feud with 
Grayson Waller, where he would be an outstanding babyface. Truly, if you want to see what LA Knight can do as a babyface, I definitely recommend watching this entire feud. Though his crowd work to his way of just moving as a babyface is very spot on. Then, after only a year in NXT, LA Knight would make his main roster debut. He would originally start out as LA Knight, where he'd do some backstage stuff with the Dirty Dogs and even do a few dark matches, but he would come back to mainstream television on SmackDown, where he'd be under the new name, Max Dupree. He announced that Mace and Mansois had been under new names and under a new alliance called the Maximum Male Models. And later, of course, they'd be joined by his storyline sister, Maxine Dupree. But then Vince McMahon announced his retirement from the WWE, giving Triple H creative control over both Raw and SmackDown once again, and you know the first thing he did was have LA Knight make his inevitable return, turning on Maximal Male Models, and once again bringing back the NXT persona. Of course, it was weird that he came back as a heel when facing heels, but the crowd did not care. Following a short-term feud with the Maximal Male Models and even Ricochet, LA Knight would begin the inevitable Bray Wyatt feud, which, you know, we just don't want to talk about. But it was after this feud ended, of course, when LA Knight lost to Bray Wyatt at the Royal Rumble, where his popularity began to increase, and slowly, step by step, he started turning into the LA Knight that we know and love today. Let me talk to you. Snap into a Slim Jim. Yeah. 